Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fourth annual Samaritan Regional Scholarly Symposium. I'm Olivia Pipitone. I'm a biostatistician at Samaritan, and I'm going to be moderating the presentations today. We have some great talks lined up for you, but we also have over 30 posters online at this website, semhealth.org slash symposium. These posters show the great work being done by our Samaritan trainees, by Comp Northwest medical students, and OSU students as well. So we really hope you guys can find some time soon to take a look at the posters at the website. Here's our list of presenters this morning. Uh, each presenter is going to talk for about 10 minutes and then we're going to have a brief Q&A session directly after each talk. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Paulina Kaiser. Paulina is the Director for Health Outcomes Research and Evaluation at Samaritan. She's a social epidemiologist by training and she's worked at Samaritan for five years. Thanks, Olivia, and uh, thanks to everybody for being with us this morning. Really excited by this um, turnout, so appreciate it. So I'm going to uh, kick things off this morning by talking a little bit about Samaritan's um, past, present, and future in regards to research and scholarly activity. Uh, try to give really just a high level overview of kind of where we're coming from and where we're trying to go. So uh, the origins of kind of the modern um, research infrastructure at Samaritan really begin in um, 2008 and really begin with Barb Crony, um, who is on the call. Uh, so Barb joined Samaritan in 2008 and has been basically the driving force behind kind of everything we're going to talk about today. Um, so in 2008, we uh, established the regional IRB, um, also had our first cancer patient enrolled in a clinical trial. The following year, the clinical research department was uh, created. A couple years later, we graduated the first uh, class of residents, and GME programs have been a huge source of energy and enthusiasm um, and graduation requirements uh, related to scholarly activity, and that continues to be true um, to this day. Uh, a couple years uh, later, in 2014, we established a uh, cooperative agreement with OSU to provide a legal framework for the collaborative projects we were doing. Um, the following year, we started doing collaborative research at the Samaritan Athletic Medicine Building um, with Sean Newsom and Matt Robinson, and we'll be hearing more from Sean in about 40 minutes. Uh, the following year, um, Barb created the Research Development Office um, and hired in me and Olivia. So as an epidemiologist, my skill set is really around study design and interpretation. Um, and Olivia brings um, a lot of technical expertise around data management um, and statistical analysis. Uh, better yet, she does a great job of explaining why she's doing what she's doing um, and, and what she's doing. So our job was has been to support um, investigator initiated research, which really meant working uh, with a lot of residents. Um, hopefully, I'm kind of guessing at this point, most of you listening have worked with one or both of us um, over the past few years. Uh, so recently, Olivia has has taught herself SQL and has worked with our IS department um, to learn uh, how the Epic Data Warehouse works, which has been a huge asset for um, our research uh, productivity. And then last year, we had this kind of reorganization and rebranding as Shore. Uh, so uh, what is Shore? So now we've kind of aligned all of our research related resources um, under Samaritan Health Outcomes Research and Evaluation. Uh, so these are the people um, involved that are doing this work. Um, I'll note the only new name on here um, is Kristen Baker, who joined the clinical research team um, in April. Uh, everyone else has kind of been in these roles um, for years now. So we still have a really strong clinical research team um, that primarily supports uh, sponsored trials, a lot of pharmaceutical and device trials in oncology and cardiology, more recently expanding into rheumatology and infectious disease as well. Um, and now they're also helping to support some of the more um, clinical investigator initiated research um, that we're working on. Um, Olivia and I still primarily focus on the investigator initiated research and quality improvement projects. Uh, we're also getting more involved with some of the more um, internal operations type work, um, being able to provide some support around data and evaluation. Uh, so Laura handles um, our library um, as well as provides a lot of support to Olivia um, and to Steph Mock, who um, uh, is the, the face of the IRB and make sure that we're um, in compliance with all of the um, 
everything we need to be in compliance with. And then finally, we have uh, Belinda McCauley uh, as a consultant who's currently uh, research faculty in the OSU um, Department of Surgery, um, but I hope it's okay to share, was recently offered a position at Comp Northwest, um, which is very exciting. And then, um, yeah, so that's a team. So the other kind of major event of our present time is this little thing called COVID. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. So when COVID hit uh, back in March of 2020, one of the first ways that we were able to respond um, was with data. So Olivia started creating this registry report. Originally, it was a, a daily task, and then it became um, a weekly task for many, many weeks. Um, and the goal was really just to help leadership kind of track what was happening and the impact that it was having on hospital resources. And this report then uh, became the basis of uh, the Power BI dashboard that now displays this same type of information with uh, pretty colors um, and updates automatically, which is nice. So I think this was an example of the, um, the importance of, of being able to think through how to make the data useful, um, especially at the beginning of COVID. You know, there was a ton of information that was available, but nobody really knew what to look for or what to focus on. Um, and data is, is useful to the extent that it can help to answer questions um, so that Olivia and I could really jump in to help um, kind of digest and present the data in a meaningful way, I think was an important contribution instead of just um, kind of throwing up a million charts in Power BI. So uh, COVID also brought a lot of um, new opportunities for research, uh, which again was was pretty exciting. Um, and we kind of jumped right in pretty early on. So in April, uh, we started contributing to the Mayo Clinic registry um, on COVID cases, uh, as well as the ASCO registry for cancer patients with COVID. We also set up a, a biobank repository that is uh, still to this day collecting samples from hospitalized COVID patients um, that could be used for future research studies. Uh, in May, Dr. Delmonico uh, launched his GOTCHA study, which was a, a pilot study of hospitalized patients um, testing pioglitazone uh, as a potential treatment. Uh, in June, we started working with Joe Agor um, in the College of Engineering at OSU uh, on a project to document uh, surge operations in response to COVID with two different hospital systems, so with us and then also working with um, an academic team at NC State and a health system in the DC area. And Bharat Gopal has been um, really instrumental in working with us on this project as well. And then September apparently was a busy month, uh, so we started a sponsored pharmaceutical study for COVID patients. Um, uh, we launched a study of antibody prevalence that over the next kind of four months or so, we ended up testing over 900 patients for COVID antibodies, uh, and that was funded by the Samaritan Foundations. Um, and then John Jones started his study of COVID um, outcomes for rheumatology patients, which we will also hear about um, in a few minutes. So now that we have left 2020 behind, <laughs> where, are we, where are we at today? So as of um, yesterday, uh, the IRB had, was managing 154 active studies um, at the moment. The clinical research department was supporting 84 patients active on 15 studies across five different specialties. Um, Olivia and I continue to support uh, investigator initiated projects. I did not ask Olivia how many projects she's working on right now. Probably don't want to know. Um, in previous years, we've supported uh, upwards of 130 projects a year, and I think that um, is probably a conservative estimate at this point. Uh, so overall, uh, Shore staff are working with um, Samaritan employees from all five hospitals, uh, clinics, health plans. Um, we uh, coordinate the scientific review committee that uh, meets monthly to provide multidisciplinary advice on um, feasibility and scientific merit of proposed projects. Um, and finally, we have multiple active uh, research co collaborations at various stages of um, development and uh, execution in collaboration with OSU and Comp Northwest. So what about the future? So we got kind of three big buckets of, of where we're trying to go. So one is um, absolutely to continue supporting Samaritan and finding opportunities for, um, for alignment with all the different kind of um, divisions and work going on at Samaritan. So that definitely looks like continuing to promote um, data and analytics skills in our trainees, um, supporting our growth as a, a learning health system as we try to make 
uh, research and, and data and quality improvement processes a routine part of healthcare delivery. Definitely expanding clinical research opportunities into uh, new specialties. Um, and lastly, trying to establish some kind of cross disciplinary and more longitudinal um, areas of focus for our research portfolio. Secondly, collaborations. So that may look like um, increasing collaborations with OSU and with Comp Northwest um, and, and using kind of those connections to expand into more basic science and into more translational types of research. And then finally, dissemination. So really trying to um, build awareness and visibility of Samaritan research, um, for example, at events like this, uh, and also trying to kind of publish in peer re reviewed journals and, um, and uh, be able to present at national conferences. Um, I'll also note here that we're in the process of revamping the uh, research pages on the public facing Samaritan website. So hopefully those will be finalized in the next uh, week or two. Um, and for uh, Samaritan staff, we've also recently updated our internal SharePoint site off of the Insider. So if you haven't stumbled on that yet, um, check it out under departments uh, and research and IRB. So that is the end of my um, my talk. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions there maybe. Thanks so much, Paulina. I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Anybody who has a question, feel free to use the raise your hand option and I'll call on you to ask or post something in the chat. Paulina, there's a question in the chat for you from Dr. Del Monaco. He says, can you elaborate on Comp Northwest? Yeah, so I think there's there's definitely a lot of uh, potential with Comp Northwest, and we've had kind of various conversations with a couple of the faculty members there. Um, uh, Olivia also was probably better uh, positioned to speak to this. So Olivia uh, maintains the process for connecting Comp Northwest medical students uh, with Samaritan research projects, and so there's a kind of well established process for. Um, for getting students access to, to EPIC so they can help with chart reviews or those types of, of data collection processes. So um, yeah, there's been, I mean, obviously I think Comp Northwest is, is, um, is, uh, is a huge partner and I think that's definitely something that we're looking to, um, to grow as well. Olivia, do you wanna add anything else to that? I think you did a great job, yeah, explaining. Yeah, there's, they have been so helpful when we have projects that need some manual you know, time like chart reviews, it can be so helpful to have a couple students involved. And I think it's a great way for them to get some familiarity with EPIC and just medical records, electronic medical records in general. So it's been a great partnership. And we have uh, Belinda McCauley with her hand. Belinda, please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you, Paulina, for a fantastic talk. Um, I, it's not really a question, just but more of a comment and expanding on this conversation regarding Comp Northwest. Uh, so as Paulina mentioned, I was offered a, a faculty position there, um, still in negotiation, but I really hope to uh, be able to uh, contribute to the collaboration between Comp Northwest and Samaritan. Um, a part of my goals there is to really bring in Samaritan physicians and provide them a resource for basic science research. And so if anyone is interested, and I know I've already spoken to, uh, to John Jones and Brian Delmonico about this, but if there's anyone else who is interested in expanding their research into more basic science realm or translational realm, uh, please let me know. Awesome. Thank you, Belinda. I didn't want to say too much, but I am very glad that you did. So thanks. <laughs> we have another question from Dr. Gopal in the chat. Has there been thoughts concerning developing community oriented primary care or community based participatory research projects? Oh, have there been thoughts? There have been lots of thoughts. Um, I personally think that's that's a great idea and that's definitely kind of aligns with some of my personal interests. Um, I think there's also some opportunity there um, to take advantage of where um, IHN CCO and the, the CCO projects kind of at the state level are, are being pushed to really expand um, what types of domains are, are relevant to healthcare. Um, so 
Uh, all that to say, yes, there have been a lot of thoughts and I'm definitely going to follow up with you and we're going to have more conversation about this, uh, but I would say nothing kind of concrete is planned at this point. Great, and we have uh, one more question from Gayatri and I think this will be the last question before we switch to our next presenter. Uh, Gayatri's question is, Dr. Kaiser, could you talk more about the plans on bringing longitudinal types of studies through Samaritan? Yeah, so I think this is, um, you know, one of the realities of working a lot with residents is that residents are only here for a couple years um, and the, the amount of time that they have to kind of dedicate to scholarly activity projects is, is kind of uh, limited and, and um, interspersed throughout their time. So if we can kind of move towards um, more longer term, uh, broader types of projects that then residents can kind of slot into or, or chunk off a, a piece of, um, I think that'll open up kind of a new world of possibility for taking on some more um, impactful types of projects and really starting to, um, um, you know, to kind of just expand into a, a new uh, dimension in that way. Great. Thanks so much, Paulina. And with that, I think uh, we're going to move on to our next presenter. Dr. John Jones. John is a rheumatologist at Samaritan Rheumatology in Corvallis. He's been with Samaritan for just under four years. In addition to seeing patients, he enjoys teaching residents about the basics of rheumatology. He also has a strong interest in clinical and translational research. Great, Diana, thank you, Olivia. Can you see me and my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, very good. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, the project that I did here with some of my colleagues. This is entitled Risk of COVID-19 Infection and Hospitalization in Patients with Inflammatory Rheumatic Disease. I'd like to thank my co-authors because we do have a manuscript that is currently under review. That includes Callie Chiraboga, who is a Comp Northwest student. She's just graduating and going on to an internal medicine felt, uh, an internal medicine residency. Olivia has been very helpful. And then a couple of doctors at other institutions, Christopher Jones and Brian Greenberg. So this um, question, when the pandemic hit, was really something we struggled with in rheumatology because we have a lot of patients who are on immunosuppressive medications and we didn't know how to counsel them, what was their risk. And so uh, because this was unknown, we decided that uh, it was worth seeing if we could answer the question. So we came up with a hypothesis that patients with inflammatory rheumatic disease have a higher risk of catching COVID-19 compared to those without inflammatory rheumatic disease. And the thought behind this was that not only does their disease, their underlying disease, potentially put them at higher risk, but many of these patients are on medications that put them at higher risk of infection. So we came up with a study design that would help us try to answer the question is what is, you know, are these patients at an increased risk? So we wanted to look at the incidence of acquiring COVID-19 infection, rate of hospitalization and death. And we were gonna look at uh, patients with inflammatory rheumatic disease versus the general population. And so the way we wanted to do this was to do it through chart review. And it was uh, immediately apparent that our population at Samaritan was not going to be sufficient. Um, and so we, uh, Kelly Chiraboga and I were talking and we needed to find other institutions that we could uh, partner with so that we were able to get enough patients to actually have reasonable data. So we reached into our bags of contacts and tried to figure out who we could contact. And Kelly had a contact at Kaiser Northwest and they were very interested. And so we were able to make contact with Brian Greenberg, who is a rheumatologist there. And then I had a contact at Intermountain Healthcare, which is uh, the main healthcare system in Utah and Southern Idaho. Uh, we, we reached out to a couple of institutions in California and unfortunately didn't get any interest. We also reached out to Providence Healthcare, which involves a large part of Western Washington and Northern Oregon. And they actually were quite interested, 
But when we told them that we didn't have any funding, we were just kind of doing this on our own, and that we had a timeline that didn't fit their timeline, they decided not to join us. So unfortunately, we didn't get them. But we did collaborate with both Kaiser Northwest and IHC. <clears throat> so the plan would be to look at the total adult population within each healthcare system uh, and also all of the patients with inflammatory rheumatic disease. And then we were going to look at the total number of COVID cases from March until the end of July and all of those cases that were hospitalized and resulted in death. There were a lot of um, obstacles that we encountered, and I just wanted to briefly talk about those because they are important to acknowledge when you're doing research. The first thing was that we don't have, we didn't have any funding, and so we did have to rely on the the uh, good intentions and goodwill of of many experts. And so each institution was able to find a data analyst who was willing to help us out because it required a lot of um, uh, skill to be able to extract the data from the health record. And so for us at Samaritan, again, a special thanks to Olivia because she is very excellent at this and was able to help us out considerably. Another big challenge for us was the restriction of data sharing amongst institutions. And because we didn't have any pre-set uh, data sharing agreements or anything like that, it was going to be really hard to share raw data. And so what each institution had to do was to get the aggregate data and then just shared numbers in aggregate. And in fact, getting even that data shared took quite a long time, several weeks, and it really delayed our ability to do the data an analysis. And one of our goals was to look at which medications patients were on. And unfortunately, Intermountain Healthcare, who had the largest population, just through their records, weren't able to get accurate data on medications. So we had to just drop that and not have that be part of our study. So here's the results. Uh, with the three institutions, the total kind of base population that we have for adults was over 2 million. And of those 2 million, there were 26, just over 26,000 or 1.3 percent who had laboratory proven COVID-19 infection. For the total number of adults with inflammatory rheumatic disease, it was over 54,000. And of that, 470 had laboratory proven COVID-19 infection. We were really excited about these numbers. Up to this point, um, the, the few uh, you know, series or, or studies that have been looking at this had maybe 100 or, or 200 patients with rheumatic disease that were getting COVID, and we had 470. So we were really excited about the, the numbers here. One of the first things that you'll notice from our results is that the, the incidence of COVID-19 infection was lower in the rheumatic disease population. So that was a surprise, but very interesting. So this is just showing the data a little bit more uh, in another view. And really what I think is a great strength of our study, which has not been published anywhere else, is looking at the risk according to age. So if you look at the first column, these are adults without rheumatic disease, and the second column are adults with rheumatic disease. And each row has a different age. So the first row is what I just showed you. The overall rate for those without rheumatic disease is 1.3%. Those with rheumatic disease was 0.9%. But if you look at the age groups, it's very interesting. So not a surprise that if you're age 18 to 35, you have the highest rate of developing COVID or getting COVID if you don't have rheumatic disease. But that risk is much lower in patients with rheumatic disease and significantly lower. At ages 36 to 50, the risk or the incidence of COVID infection goes down, but stays stable and low in patients with rheumatic disease. At ages 51 to 65, there's no difference between the two groups. But then over the age of 65, you'll see that patients with rheumatic disease 
do have a higher incidence of COVID infection. So the take home that we got from this is that uh, while the overall risk of infection with COVID for rheumatic patients is lower, it really seems to be an age dependency. And if you're over 65, you have to be more careful. Some other data that we had included looking at comorbidities, and you'll see that our patients with rheumatic disease had a much higher percentage of comorbidities. One of the limitations of our study is that we weren't able to age stratify this data, and I wish we could have. This is not too surprising because our, um, uh, you, as you saw from the last slide, so many more of our COVID patients with IRD were older, so it's not surprising they had more, more comorbidities. But this data was actually very surprising. So you'll see that the, the hospitalization rate was 3.8% in patients without rheumatic disease and 12.3% with rheumatic disease, so higher hospitalization rate. But despite that higher hospitalization rate, the risk of death was quite a bit lower. So 13.3% in patients without rheumatic disease, but only 3.4% in patients with rheumatic disease. And I wish I could tell you exactly why that is. Uh, we, don't, we don't have enough data to say why it is, although it may be that because some of these patients were on some of the medicines that prevent the super high inflammatory response, maybe that, that protected them from actually going on to, to death. So these are our conclusions. Uh, patients with rheumatic disease had overall lower risk of COVID-19 infection compared to the general population, but this was an age-dependent feature. And so if you're younger, you may have less of a risk, but if you're over the 65, you probably have a higher risk of developing COVID-19. And even though there was a higher risk of being hospitalized due to COVID-19, there was an overall lower death rate. So that is our conclusion, and I'm going to see if I can figure out how to end my sharing. <laughs> and I'm happy to take questions. I have a question. Um, is the lower death rate um, because the patients who died actually had even more severe comorbidities like active chemotherapy or cancer or what have you? Were you able to break it down? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any of that data. And uh, as I said, this was unfunded and, and completely done with generous time of data analysts. So we, we weren't able to go and look at each individual chart and look at specific uh, things that contributed to death. So I wish I could answer your question more fully, but I can't. So one possibility, can I make a comment? Yes. One possibility is that people with heightened immune response, right, as they are in rheumatoid arthritis, right, mm -hmm. they are more apt to launch a immune response considering to infection. That's one possibility. Way to go around that would be to possibly is to have another disease state that's comparable to RA, right? Where you have that heightened response and look at COVID-19 infection rate, death rate, whatever. Yeah, so, the, um, so these are studies that are being done and, and there are, um, there are registries, uh, rheumatology registries that are looking at specific diseases within the rheumatology population. There's also studies looking at um, uh, other diseases with immunocompromised, such as cancer patients and that type of thing. Um, and, and so there are people looking to answer those specific questions. We just couldn't do it with our data. And I see the question from James Phelps about planning to publish. So yes, we have submitted this to several journals, but we finally have a journal who wants to, who's looking at it. We just uh, got a uh, several comments from reviewers and yesterday submitted our response to reviewers and hoping to get a favorable response from that soon. 
We have another question in the chat from Dr. Smith. He says, I wonder if immunosuppressed patients with IRD are were, were generally more cautious than the general population, more mask use, hand washing, isolation. Yep, that's a that's a very real possibility. There was a study, we, we tried to see if there was any studies in the US that looked at this. There was a study study in Denmark that asked this specific question. And it, it, they showed that patients with rheumatic disease, especially on immunosuppressants, did have a higher rate of cautious behavior. So they were less likely to go out in public. They were more diligent about wearing masks. So that probably plays some role um, in our findings that the younger rheumatic patients had a lower infection rate. But again, we just can't say for sure. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Jones. I'm gonna to have to move to the next presenter just for time's sake, but you're getting some great praise in the chat and I think it's well-deserved. Great Thanks. work on that. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Justin Tan. Justin is one of our chief orthopedic surgery residents. He completed his undergraduate studies at UC Davis and attended medical school at Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. Once done with residency in about six weeks, He'll be starting his adult reconstruction fellowship at Cedars Sinai Medical Center in LA. Thanks, Olivia. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. So my name is Justin, I'm one of the orthopedic residents here. I'll be uh, presenting our uh, research project that was recently published in Arthroplasty Today. My co-authors include uh, Babe Westlake, who's one of our our PGY4. Uh, June Kim is currently an attending in Visalia, uh, and uh, we all know Olivia. And then uh, James, um, uh, Dr. James Ryan is one of our adult, adult reconstruction uh, here at Samaritan. Uh, at Dr. Canal Block versus liposomal bupivacaine paraarticular injection in total knee arthroplasty, a randomized controlled trial. A uh, little bit about why we did the study. As uh, many of us know, total knee arthroplasty is one of the most common elective procedures done by orthopedic surgeons, and it is projected to reach 3.5 million in about 20 years, uh, sorry, 10 years, to decrease perioperative complications, improve functional outcome, and limit narcotic prescriptions. There has been a focus on multimodal pain control. And as part of this effort, we were looking at liposomal bupivacaine paraarticular injection uh, as an adjunct to control uh, pain in total knee arthroplasty uh, because of its long acting properties. And what liposomal bupivacaine is, is basically just uh, plain bupivacaine that's being encapsulated in a, a lipid membrane and it's being released uh, after being injected in the uh, soft tissue. It's released over a long period of time and studies have shown that it can uh, help with pain control up to 72 hours. Uh, and we were looking at pain, pain control and functional outcome scores. And during this time, the adductor canal block was the standard uh, four hour uh, attending orthopedic surgeon at our institution in terms of pain control after uh, total knee arthroplasty. And uh, this is just basically reviewing what we were looking at and the procedures that were done during our uh, study and what we were comparing. And so again, here we have liposomal bupivacaine being in a lipid capsule on the left side. And then uh, here's what's being done by our, by our surgeon intraoperatively. So we're injecting liposomal bupivacaine around our uh, surgical wound in the, in the uh, uh, subcutaneous tissue, the tendons, the capsules. And then on the right side is our uh, anesthesiologist who's performing an ultrasound, uh, ultrasound guided um, uh, adductor canal block aiming at the saphenous nerve as a way to um, help with the pain control during and after surgery. Um, and uh, we had 57 patients in the study. Um, uh, 60 total knee procedures were then randomized to each study group. In the adductor canal block group, uh, the patient received plain bupivacaine um, uh, aiming at the saphenous nerve. And then in the liposomal bupivacaine paraarticular injection group, uh, the patient received intraoperative injection with liposomal bupivacaine. Both, both group under, underwent similar postoperative pain control and physical therapy protocol. Uh, we looked at um, the uh, postoperative pain uh, using the VAS score as our uh, primary outcome. Uh, 
and studies have shown that a difference in VAS score of about three points is considered clinically important. Our study was adequately powered to detect a difference uh, of an average of 1.5 points. Uh, we also looked at uh, uh, WOMAC functional outcome scores, knee range of motion, ambulation distance on post-operative day one, and hospital length of stay as our secondary outcomes. Uh, the demographics between both groups, liposomal bupivacaine and adductor canal block, uh, were similar in, ter in terms of age, gender, uh, BMI, uh, and here are our outcomes. This is a busy uh, table, but if what's uh, what's important to take away from here is that none of the p-values were under uh, uh, 0 0.05, so there was no statistical significance in terms of uh, pain score, Womack scores, knee range of motion, ambulation distance, or length of stay. Uh, another thing to, to look at is the average indifference in our primary outcome scores. If you look at the VAS scores, the average difference, all of them were less than point, uh, all of them were less than one, indicating that the scores were very similar. Uh, here is a figure uh, also uh, showing our results comparing the two groups. And you see during the early post-operative period, there may be a little bit more pain control in the liposomal bupivacaine group, uh, but um, this was not statistically significant. Uh, we also did a cost analysis after the study was uh, done, and liposomal bupivacaine, uh, the medication itself, did cost more than the plain bupivacaine. Uh, however, the, the adductor canal block that's performed by an, our anesthesiologist costs around $890, and so that's about uh, over $500 more. Uh, compared to the liposomal bupivacaine. In conclusion, patients undergoing primary total knee arthroplasty that receive liposomal bupivacaine periarticular injection had equivalent pain control and functional outcome scores compared to those that receive an adductor canal block, and liposomal bupivacaine periarticular injection could reduce costs. Uh, lesson learned, as a resident, I started this uh, project uh, when I was an intern, and so uh, it, I didn't get it published until uh, my chief year, and so, uh, you know, it, it may take a few years to complete a randomized control trial, and so, uh, you know, to the younger residents who are listening, you know, it can, it may take the, your whole residency to, to publish a study, and, and, and I think that's okay, because there's so many steps involved in this whole process, and early and frequent communication with the IRB does make the process easier. They will help you with the study design, uh, randomization, pay, uh, data collection, data analysis, as well as the manuscript write-up. And we uh, underwent, uh, we, we did multiple revisions for the study, uh, and, uh, you know, it finally got published, and uh, there was more, a lot of staff members who were involved in the, multi, in the different departments, and so, uh, you know, a big thank you to the different um, uh, departments that were involved, the uh, anesthesia department, the uh, pharmacy department, as well as the research department. Um, and so that's that's our study. Uh, any questions? Thanks so much, much Justin. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Dr. Phelps. He wants to know more about the blinding of patients and evaluators. You know, we were not able to uh, blind our uh, our patients because uh, blinding them would ha uh, the patient would need to uh, perform a uh, placebo uh, adductor canal block because uh, during the, uh, the adductor canal block is done preoperatively. So the patient's in the holding area and the anesthesiologist is performing the adductor canal block. And so the patient would know if they receive an adductor canal block or not. And it's pretty hard to uh, blind the surgeon as well. And so we were not able to uh, blind our patients or the, uh, the, the, the surgeons. Great. We have another question from Dr. Jones. He's wondering, has this changed standard practice for knee replacement here at Samaritan? Uh, you know, uh, for Dr. Ryan, he has switched to using liposomal bupivacaine. The reason for that is because uh, it's more surgeon controlled. Actually, uh, uh, going back to that slide earlier, like uh, it is the surgeon who, who, who controls where he inject the medication and so, the medications available in the operating room. And so he likes that more. Since the adductor canal block is being done preoperatively, 
sometimes that can uh, increase the turnover time between cases. And so Dr. Ryan likes the ability to control his, his, his um, uh, basically his flow and, and being, having the ability to, to, to um, inject the medication where he wants it to inject it. Um, and at, our, at Good Samaritan here, uh, I think the majority of uh, our uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons who do total knee replacement still uh, do the adductor canal block. And that may have to do with having the medication available in the pharmacy as well, even though, you know, we did the cost analysis showing that uh, even though the medication costs more, the procedure actually costs more for the patient to be done. Um, but of course, this has to do with the way that's billed. And so it's a definitely a, a different discussion. We have a question from Dr. Umberhand. He's asking, has liposomal bupivacaine been employed in other orthopedic procedures like total hip arthroplasty, fracture care, spinal fusions? Uh, you know, liposomal bupivacaine, the first study that, 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 that was done was mostly in, uh, you know, in general uh, surgery procedures like hemorrhoidectomies. Uh, and it has definitely been done in uh, total hip replacements. Uh, we are currently doing a, a study with Dr. Tedesco here at Good Samaritan uh, looking at um, lipobupivacaine uh, versus just plain bupivacaine in terms of pain control after tumor resections. And so uh, it's currently in the uh, patient recruitment stage. And so, yes, it has been done. And, you know, the results has been controversial in terms of does it provide additional benefits um, some study says yes, some study says no. Our, stu our, study, our study here says that there is no difference in terms of pain control or functional outcomes. Great. Last question that we'll take is uh, from Dr. Hughes. Was there any difference in longer term outcomes such as infection or functionality at one month or six months? Uh, we did not uh, look at, uh, you know, we did, our follow up was not that far out, uh, but um, most of the studies done had pretty short um, uh, uh, follow up. And so, uh, you know, I, I haven't read anything that says that there's been uh, an increase in infection or, or uh, long term um, um, uh, complications or difference in functional outcomes. The reason for that is the medication lasts only for 72 hours. So we're just looking at the immediate post operative uh, effect of these medications. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. Thanks, We're going to move to our last presenter this morning, Sean Newsom. Sean Newsom is an assistant professor in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at Oregon State University. He's here to tell us about his metabolic research studies with Samaritan Health Services. And Sean, you are on mute. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Great, and hopefully everyone can see my slides okay. Um, first thing I want to do is just say thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, and I also appreciated uh, having a shout out on your timeline earlier, Paulina, so thank you very much. Um, my objective today is, is really straightforward. I just want to make folks aware of the type of research that we're doing here at Oregon State University. Uh, namely highlighting the things that we couldn't do without the help of Samaritan Health Services. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So uh, the name of our lab is the Translational Metabolism Research Laboratory, and I figured I would start by just explaining how we got that name and what it means and how it relates to our research with Samaritan Health Services. Well, I think most folks in the room are well aware of the fact that when folks go from looking something like this to looking a little bit more like this, uh, that is the development of weight gain and overweightness and obesity, uh, that there's an increased risk for metabolic disease, namely insulin resistance, type two diabetes, and as well as numerous cardiovascular diseases. Um, as physiologists, we try to understand uh, what underlies that risk. Uh, we focus predominantly on skeletal muscle metabolism and its insulin sensitivity. Uh, following that, we also know that lifestyle interventions 
Uh, namely here, physical activity and exercise can be remarkably beneficial in terms of lowering that risk, even acute bouts of exercise. And again, as physiologists, we're trying to understand how is that working? And so that's really the axiom upon which our laboratory was built. Uh, we believe that physical activity and exercise are metabolically beneficial, and there's abundant evidence to support that claim. Uh, but our goal really is to understand how these things are working so that we can use them uh, to perhaps tailor therapeutic interventions, namely improve our exercise interventions so that they maximize metabolic benefit or uh, understand and develop new targets that ideally we could find additional therapeutic approaches to manipulate those targets to improve metabolic health. Uh, now, the, the full translational piece comes in the form of we also do research in our lab involving model systems. I'm not going to tell you about that research today, but these are the types of studies that we cannot do in humans so that we can learn things and develop new hypotheses that we can then use to test in our human participant research studies. Uh, and I just want to be clear that I do all of this work in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Matthew Robinson, also a faculty member here at Oregon State University. And we do these studies at Samaritan Athletic Medicine Center. Uh, this is an on-campus outpatient medical facility that has been fantastic in supporting the type of research that we've been doing over the last five years. So I just wanna tell you about one of those studies that we're doing now, even though, or excuse me, one that we've completed recently, uh, even though we have several that I could tell you about. <laughs> 10 minutes is not a lot of time. So I'm gonna tell you one quick vignette about the type of research that we've been doing recently, as well as highlight a future collaboration that we're, we're trying to get going right now. So the first one uh, stemming from that, that model of what our laboratory really does, a question that we've tried to address and answer is how can we identify mechanisms to explain improved glucose metabolism after exercise? Uh, and I wanna put a little context around that. We know that in response to a meal, when insulin is released, it binds insulin receptors all over the body, but very importantly on skeletal muscle. And this plays a critical role in getting glucose transporters to the cell surface of skeletal muscle tissue, which is where the majority of carbohydrate after a meal ends up. It actually gets taken up into skeletal muscle. We know that this process is defective uh, in the context of insulin resistance, states such as prediabetes or type two diabetes, uh, and things like exercise can help to resolve this. Uh, but if we dig a little deeper, we know that there's a complex signaling cascade that is responsible for getting those glucose transporters to the cell surface. And this is really the type of research that we do. We try to understand what's going wrong with this sequence of dominoes that is resulting in fewer glucose transporters getting to the cell surface. And research from our laboratory and others has shown that uh, dominoes upstream of this protein AKT, if you will, uh, do not seem to be improved by exercise activity. So we tried to turn our attention elsewhere in a recent study focusing on a protein called RAC1. Our lab and others has recently shown that insulin signaling also activates RAC1, and this plays a critical role in getting these glucose transporters to the cell surface. Even more important is recent research has identified that acute exercise also increases the activity of RAC1. And so this led us to test the question, does increased activation of RAC1 after exercise contribute to the improvement in insulin action? I.e., is this responsible for the improvement in skeletal muscle glucose uptake after exercise? So how did we actually do this? Uh, in short, we recruited uh, otherwise sedentary adults, folks who do not regularly exercise, both males and females. And I'll highlight that almost always females tend to be more apt to volunteer for these types of studies. This study was no exception. Uh, we had two identical metabolic study visits uh, completed at Samaritan Athletic Medicine Center. Uh, the reason I say they are identical in quotes is because in one condition, the individuals were uh, asked to rest, where in the other condition, they were asked to perform a single bout of physical exercise, which in this case was a cycle ergometry or a stationary bike at 65% of their VO2 max, which is a moderate exercise intensity for one hour. The rest of these visits were in fact identical. And so what this looks like is we have people fast overnight. They come to the, uh, the SAM center, as we like to call it. We place IVs in these individuals so that we can do some blood sampling and some infusions I'll tell you about in just a minute. 
Uh, we monitor their uh, resting metabolic rate and, and also look at what types of substrate they're using, what they're oxidizing to, to power their resting metabolism. The, the difference between these visits is whether these individuals rest or perform exercise. And I should say these are the same folks coming back for both of these visits in a randomized order. What we ultimately do is test how responsive they are to insulin by actually infusing insulin. We effectively mimic a meal without giving them a meal. And then we backfill with a uh, glucose infusion so that we maintain their, their uh, blood glucose concentrations. And this allows us to understand how sensitive individuals are to insulin and to see how that's changed as a function of exercise activity. And then the real magic happens uh, when we actually take skeletal muscle biopsies. I promise it's not as bad as it sounds, and these are small samples that we obtain from the vastus lateralis that we can use in our lab to then look at those molecular signaling events to see how they've changed as a function of exercise. So given the time constraints, I'm going to be really brief in summarizing our data, not actually show you the data and just summarize it visually. If you have any questions, I can, of course, share that with you uh, after in the question and answer period. So in short, if I summarize our data, the first thing that we showed is not, not surprising whatsoever, our acute bout of exercise did in fact improve insulin sensitivity or glucose uptake in the skeletal muscle, which is great. That was a fundamental premise, so glad to see science worked. Uh, the next thing I wanna tell you is that we looked at signaling uh, upstream and at the level of AKT in RAC1. And we actually showed that there was no improvement in those signaling events. So we focused on some additional dominoes. And what we ultimately learned is that other steps of insulin signaling and those that are independent of the insulin receptor seem to be important for the improvement in glucose uptake after exercise, which is summarized here. And if you're saying to yourself, great, what does that actually mean? What this allows us to do is then say, these are the type of signaling events that we need to try to optimize when we uh, develop exercise prescriptions and also look towards new interventions that can modify the activity of these proteins because we know that they are responsible for the improvement in glucose uptake. So that's just one quick vignette of something that we're, we've re recently completed as part of our collaboration with Samaritan Health Services. Uh, I wanna highlight the fact that we have several other studies that are ongoing or in development. One briefly is uh, a question, and I really liked Paulina said, data is only <laughs> effective in its ability to answer questions. And that's what we're trying to do, answer questions. So one of the questions is how is skeletal muscle mitochondrial function improved with acute exercise in otherwise sedentary individuals. We have some specific hypotheses about how this is happening so that we can understand mitochondrial protein turnover. Uh, one of our doctoral students, Philip Batterson, is actually presenting a poster uh, as part of this research symposium, so I encourage you to check that out. We have a few other uh, ongoing studies right now focusing on the impact of insulin in skeletal muscle metabolism. One question being, does high circulating insulin contribute to skeletal muscle lipid accumulation in obesity? And we're also trying to understand the impact of insulin as a regulator of mitochondrial fuel preference within skeletal muscle. So something that may be a little bit more near and dear to many folks in the room is uh, an impending collaboration that we have, something that we're proposing right now as a grant application to the National Institutes of Health is really designed to answer this question, which is can SGLT2 inhibitors be used to improve skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity among individuals with prediabetes? Many of you may know that SGLT2 inhibitors are a relatively effective treatment for type 2 diabetes. However, they're not yet being used in individuals with prediabetes. We think they can be effective, uh, namely through improving skeletal muscle metabolism. So as a very brief overview of the type of study that we're proposing, we're looking to recruit individuals that are overweight or obese that have been recently diagnosed with prediabetes, fitting in with a specific age range, which I could explain the, the, the rationale for that in a bit. Um, and I realize I'm gonna throw a lot at you, but just to demonstrate the type of sophisticated research that we're trying to do with Samaritan is that we are trying to do a placebo-controlled comparison of SGLT2 inhibitors uh, looking at prediabetes-related outcomes in this population, as well as more in-depth analysis of skeletal muscle metabolic health. 
Um, I want to highlight again that this is a, a proposal in preparation. So this is not ongoing yet. I can't give you any data. Uh, hopefully we'll be successful in obtaining funding uh, and get this study going within the next year or so. Uh, but I really want to briefly highlight the fact that this type of research truly is collaborative. Uh, the, the research team that we're developing uh, is pretty substantial, and hopefully you can see that this is a nice collaboration between individuals at Oregon State University and numerous individuals at Samaritan Health Services. So uh, two in particular I really want to highlight are Samantha Shaw and Corbett Richards, who are new to our, uh, our research world and have generously uh, volunteered their time and effort to be a part of this grant proposal. Uh, with that said, there's a number of individuals on here that I haven't thanked. So uh, none of the research that I've, I've talked about or the research questions uh, I mentioned would be possible without a large number of individuals within the Samaritan system. Um, I, I don't have time to name all of them here, but some of the folks uh, that have been mentioned and even presented. In particular, uh, Barb Crony is instrumental in allowing us to be able to do this type of research. And very recently, uh, Paulina, Tony, Stephanie have been critical in our ability to develop the, the proposal I told you about. Um, individuals within the pharmacy um, and obviously a whole host of folks at, at the SAM Center. Um, with that, the last thing I'll do is acknowledge folks uh, within my research group and bring your attention to the fact that if you want to learn more about our laboratory or our ongoing research, you can always do that by visiting our website here. Uh, and lastly, uh, we've been successful thus far in achieving uh, some grant funding to do this type of research. Uh, very appropriately, I'd like to highlight the John C. Urkla Endowment for Health and Human Performance. Uh, within the Good Sam Foundation that has been instrumental in allowing us to do this type of research. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. It's really exciting to hear about collaborations like this. I'll give people just a minute to see if anyone has a question they want to raise their hand or post anything in the chat. Go ahead, Dr. Jones. Thank you. I have a question, Dr. Newsom. Um, the exercise effect on AMP K that led to increased glute. Do you know how durable that response is? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, <laughs> I'll try to keep it brief. Um, in the study that we looked at, we're we are obtaining muscle biopsy samples. Uh, two and three hours after the bout of exercise, and we are still seeing downstream activation of AMPK, which is robustly activated uh, acutely during exercise. Other research shows that that really is kind of that window, that three to four hours tends to be the limit of when you see activation of AMPK, but uh, I'll leave it at that for now. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our presenters this morning. It was amazing to hear about all the work going on. And thank you to everybody who's here listening in. We really appreciate you joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and post a link to the posters in the chat so you guys can find it. And I'll be emailing it out uh, to everyone as well. Thank you, everyone, and hope you guys have a great rest of your day.